Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Uh, just a quick piece of housekeeping. We're not going to do Q&A from the floor, but if anyone wants to talk about this stuff later on, then grab one of us or one of the panellists at the end. Um, I'm well aware that you didn't come here to uh, see me talk or hear me talk, so I'm going to shut up reasonably quickly. But what I will say is that uh, those of you amongst us who are eagle-eared will hear that I'm not from the US. Um, that isn't actually a coincidence. There's a reason for that. And the reason is that a lot of these issues are really impactful on US companies that want to do business outside of the US. I know it's a shock to many that there is actually a marketplace outside of the US or even outside of the Valley, but there is. Uh, and that's relatively important, and it's really important to know the sensitivities around doing business outside of the US. Uh, so I will introduce our panellists. Uh, you will have worked out that we're not in the order that it says on the screen. There will be a test at the end to work out uh, which names go with which people. But I'll ask the panellists to introduce themselves and give a quick summary of their take uh, and their perspective on this issue. Starting with you, Michelle. I'm Michelle Paulson. I'm the legal director of the Wikimedia Foundation, the nonprofit that runs Wikipedia as well as a number of other online collaborative projects. Um, I handle mostly privacy and our global litigation portfolio. Um, anything in particular you would like me to discuss? Uh, maybe a, a, a 30 second or a 20 second synopsis of, of the issues as you see them. Um, there's quite a lot. I think one of the things that I would love to talk about more today is um, how important it is to think about privacy of your users from start to finish in development and your company ethos and how much that will later impact the way that your company grows and how it approaches um, privacy concerns as le legislation grows and changes both in the US and abroad. Um, you're going to find that as you approach new markets, it's going to be increasingly difficult mostly because a lot of these um, regulations that are coming forth don't completely understand the technology that you're developing and they're frequently contradicting each other. Um, so it's important to keep track of what's going on and how your company can adapt. Awesome. Your turn, Nate. Hey, thanks, guys. Um, thanks, Ben, and thanks, Tulio. I'm Nate Cardozo. I'm a senior staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation here in San Francisco. I've been at EFF sort of on and off since 2009 and permanent staff since 2012. So I've been around for a while. Um, EFF is 26 years old, so an internet years were ancient. Uh, we defend civil liberties, privacy, free speech, free expression, and innovation in the digital world. Um, my practice is focused on uh, privacy and free expression and transparency. Uh, and my, my pitch to you guys is everybody understands what privacy by design is by now. Hopefully, if you don't, um, come see me after class and I can yell at you. Um, but privacy by design is pretty well understood and well known. I would like you guys to think about transparency by design. Uh, transparency is important for democracy, for policy, uh, and for building secure products. Uh, one of the um, so one of the things that I do at EFF is I manage our Who Has Your Back report, which is an annual report we produce with gold stars. I'll talk a little bit about this later, um, and we we evaluate companies on their transparency regarding government requests, among other things. Um, and uh, and I, I'll, I'll talk a little more about this later, but transparency reporting specifically is a very effective advocacy tool to protect the security of your users. Um, not something a lot of developers think about, but it's time to start. Over to you, Sheila. I am uh, Associate General Counsel at Twilio. Um, I manage our privacy program among other hats I wear, but privacy is one of the big things I uh, help um, Twilio navigate. Um, from my perspective, I'm sort of boots on the ground dealing with this issue every day with um, our R&D team, with our customers, tackling these issues, and to echo some of the things that Michelle commented on, it's important to think about um, these global privacy issues early. It's not hard to be a global company today, particularly if you're in a mobile app I and mean, you just click a button and now you're available to the world. Um, unfortunately, as I've told Twilions in our, our privacy training, um, while our technology is global, the laws are not. They have borders. And understanding what those borders are is going to help 
grow your business, um, get ahead of some of these issues early on, and you know, rather than having to retrofit something after the fact to make it work on a global stage, you can be building from the get-go um, with these, these ideas in mind, these concepts in mind, so that when, you're, when you are going out and trying to get your first German customer or um, UK customer, you can actually talk the talk, you're ready for it, you're ready to handle those privacy and security issues. So that's, I think that's something that's really important to be aware of those issues now. I'm Evan Engstrom. I'm the executive director at Engine. Engine's a nonprofit advocacy and research organization that uh, works to create better public policy for startups. So we try to connect uh, your voices with folks in Washington and throughout the country uh, to get these rules right because they're going to impact you. And I want to really reiterate that, that point made earlier about how um, smaller companies are, are not having their voices heard or not being considered in these debates. And, and particularly with questions around security and privacy, I think it's really, really important because the rules being put in place are going to affect startups more uh, in more detrimental ways than you might imagine. Um, but the, the, the positive side of this, I suppose, is they want to hear from you. People in government want to hear your voice on this. They just haven't. Um, and they need to hear your voice because, you know, I, I think as we think about Washington and there's sort of a bad taste in your mouth about, well, they only really listen to big entities, um, it, which is true, but again, they're, they want to hear from you. and. It's sort of the, the level of sophistication uh, around these issues that you're hearing in Washington is troubling to say the least, just generally when it comes to the technology, but more importantly how it applies to small entities versus large entities. I think we'll get into some of those distinctions later, but um, as these discussions are happening around questions like encryption and privacy, um, if we don't get this right now, uh, it'll be problematic going forward. Even that, um, you know, I want to reflect on something you said around around awareness, and, and I think um, when I was talking about this panel uh, with the organisers, uh, I reflected on the fact that there's every chance that for the, the smaller companies that are here, uh, there isn't there isn't, isn't awareness that's going on. So there's two there's two things that we want to do. We want to create advocacy for, for change and for for, for good, good legislation, but we really need to make sure that there, there is awareness from from within the companies around the issues. So, so I guess the question to all of you is, given the tone in Washington, given what we've seen over the past few months, is it actually feasible for US companies to remain competitive on, on the global stage, given the, the, the current thrust of legislation? Who wants to start? I can tackle that one a little bit. I give it a shot. I think the way that U.S. companies will continue to stay competitive is because of the amazing innovation. And as we continue to build amazing products, platforms, channels for, for thought, um, all the amazing things that all of the folks here are doing uh, will help continue to make us competitive, but it is continuing to be, it's going to be harder and harder uh, because of some of these global issues in, um, or it, it could become harder and harder. But is, but is innovation really a, uh, is, really, is that really going to foil legislation? You know, if legislation fundamentally says, no, you cannot do this, you cannot work in this jurisdiction, no, no amount of, of innovation. You know, Evan, you, you were talking to lots of small companies that are super innovative, but if, if they haven't got a license to operate, then, you know. Well, I'm not saying we should not follow the law, <laughs> but, um, there are some pretty innovative ways of getting around these things, but your point is a good one. It's not going to trump everything, and it's going to be harder for the smaller companies to get in if we don't stop some of this, uh, if we don't shut down this train, um, and, or at least start addressing some of these issues and come up with something that will work on a global basis. It's going to be a lot harder. I think it's going to be harder for some of the really cool, great ideas to reach... Um, as broadly as they could. Uh, but I do think that they're, the thing that we have going for us here is we do have a lot of really smart, innovative companies who are going to try really cool things, but we do need to get that, those voices heard and we need to make sure that um, the path is cleared so we don't have to spend our energy on figuring out how to get out there, but can focus our energy on how to build better, cooler, more innovative products and put the energy in the right place. Yeah, I think there was a time, kind of echoing uh, something you mentioned there, I think there was a time when it was probably easier to sort of fly under the radar and not have to worry about the political landscape. Um, you innovate, if you get big enough, then you deal with government. I think that's 
less and less true. Um, we're having we're seeing more broad based uh, legislation that impacts the technology sector. Uh, throughout the country regardless of size. I think a good example is something like, you know, the way the FTC is handling enforcement around data privacy issues. I, you know, having spoken with people at the FTC, I know they've said, you know, historically, if you're small potatoes, we're not gonna pay attention, but I think they're starting to target everyone now. I think they recognize that this, these issues are, are you know, basically throughout the, the ecosystem and pretty soon um, as companies grow and as people become more sophisticated about these, these issues in Washington, um, or at least more aware of them, uh, you're going to see those types of actions happen for smaller entities. I think as um, many people have started talking about, about how you need to really get out there and talk about these issues is one of the things that I've noticed when I'm, I've been present in discussions that are talking about major legislation and shifting of responsibilities to technology companies is that it's, it's abundantly clear that everyone seems to think that every tech company is Google and has the resources of Google, and that's simply not true. Um, and I mean, honestly, Google wasn't Google for a very long time, and they probably wouldn't have been able to afford some of the suggestions that are now being thrown out as something that's feasible across the industry. And when you are looking at um, and hearing these discussions, they, the people that they're talking to are Amazon and Google, and as you say, like you need to find a way to be able to talk talk about these issues, not just in these discussions, but make it part of the common conversation in day-to-day -day life. Explain what you do, explain the company, take away some of the mystery um, of how your organization functions and what it can and can't do. Nate, any thoughts? Well, so your original question is, you know, is, is, the, uh, is the regulatory environment in the United States putting uh, putting, the, putting us at risk? Or are we going to be able to compete globally? Um, the answer is maybe. Um, I'm a lawyer, so it depends is the answer I'll give for everything. Uh, if the FBI gets its way and gets something like the Burr-Feinstein bill passed uh, and signed into law, the answer will definitely be no. Right? The FBI wants lawful access to everything, to every sort of communication, to every sort of stored data, to every sort of networking equipment, all the way from home routers to infrastructure level switches. Um, and if that happens, then American businesses will not be able to compete. No one will buy an Android or an iOS device. No one will buy a Cisco or a Juniper router. No one will use an American-based uh, communication service outside the United States, period. Uh, and that's something that put, a, put all of the privacy and security issues aside. Um, that alone is enough reason to oppose some uh, elements of the American government's uh, plans for encryption, let's call it that. So uh, given that I'm not a US citizen uh, and uh, notwithstanding that I have to get through TSA this afternoon, uh, I can be slightly dismissive uh, of your elected representatives. And we talked before about awareness, awareness from the uh, you know, small businesses perspective or startups perspective. Um, but now onto awareness in Washington. I mean, we've got people making decisions for all of us uh, who generally don't use smartphones, uh, and their only idea of email is getting their, their PAs to, to, to print them out so that they, they can read them. Um, isn't it just ludicrous that you've got those sorts of people making decisions for all of us who don't really understand uh, the technology spectrum? Uh, yes, it is, uh, <laughs> certainly. I, I would say, though, that for every horrible bill put out by representatives that aren't interested in learning about these issues. There are a lot that care a lot and are interested in learning. It's just they haven't been exposed to this argument. Um, I, I met with a senator a couple weeks back to talk about encryption uh, and was talking through sort of the Apple FBI thing and, and made the point like, well, if, if you're mandating that Apple build this operating system and they have to devote something like you know, six employees full time for you know, two weeks or something to, to just build the, the decrypted OS, um, no startup is going to be able to do that. They're just going to fold immediately because they don't have six engineers to build that. And his response was basically like, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Which, you know, they should be thinking about that and they want to be thinking about that. It's, it's incumbent upon this community to make that point known. And again, you know, the, if, if you can take away one positive thing from what probably will be an otherwise depressing talk is uh, you can make that known. Uh, they really do want to hear from you. Um, but the, you know, these staffs that, that legislators have are small. Maybe they have one tech policy person 
you know, working for them that understands these issues. Uh, and their, their time is divided amongst all the big players. So, uh, you know, you really have to, to make the effort to get out there and, and, and not just expect them to, you know, listen to us um, from afar. We have to make that, that effort to get it done. I mean, increasingly, there are members of Congress uh, who do understand the tech. We have a couple here in California. We have a mathematician who's a member of Congress from the Central Valley. We have a computer scientist who's a member of Congress from down south, the Santa Monica area. Um, the problem is they're all still young, and they don't hold committee chairman uh, committee chairs. Uh, that's not going to change for a while. So we have we're, it's an uphill slog uh, for a decade or two, probably, until we get people who understand what what we are talking about um, as committee chairs. The other two of you have any thoughts on uh, the, the quality or otherwise of the elected representatives? Well, the one thing that you do get going for you, what I learned when I visited Washington uh, a month ago, was that at least many of the staffers are young. They're very young. Um, they're 20-somethings, they're right out of college, and um, we, can, we can hope that some of them will help try to educate up, but uh, to the point made earlier uh, by Evan, they have a lot on their plates, and so um, they're going to take the meetings with who shows up, and they do want to hear from you. They all like to talk about small businesses. That's what, that's what these all are. That's what developers are, are, they're small businesses. So um, you get to be that small business that they talk about. So take, it, take advantage of that if you can. The government is currently prioritizing the security of the country over its individual citizens. And that balance needs to shift a little bit. They need to remember that the people that they are constantly talking about protecting and safeguarding are you. Um, and you need to be able to translate that into terms whether they're 15 and a super genius um, or someone who is 80 and has never really used a computer before. Um, these are relatable things. Privacy is a concept that we've had since the beginning of time. That There's a sense of violation that anyone can feel when that privacy is violated. And I think that if you can make it relatable and how, show how it impacts each and every one of us, and including them, um, things might start to shift and that priority might change. Nate, I know that the EFF rates organisations on their response to government requests. Um, can you give us a bit of some highlights of your most recent survey and, and, and some trends that you're seeing there? Sure. Um, so uh, this is the Who Has Your Back report, the report that I mentioned earlier. And we, we evaluate companies on how they respond to government requests for data and how well they protect user information from government overreach. Uh, we, found, we started this report in 2011. Um, so this is the, the sixth annual report, came out last month. And we've noticed a couple of, of, of very good trends. When we started the report, only Google had produced a transparency report. All, almost nobody had law enforcement guidelines. Almost no one had an active presence on the Hill. Uh, and we, we were rating companies like Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Microsoft, uh, AT&T, Comcast, ISPs, social media, and cloud providers, essentially, is who we were rating. Um, and by the time the 2015 report came out, it was almost completely full of stars. The companies had really upped their game in terms of transparency, in terms of uh, fighting in the courts, in terms of fighting in Congress, and in terms of substantive policies. So this year, we dropped all of the companies that we had rated. We didn't, we, we didn't look at Google, we didn't look at Facebook, we didn't look at Twitter, uh, and instead we went to sharing economy companies because it's time that the rest of the industry start thinking about these issues. Um, and the, the big guys, Uber and Airbnb and Lyft, uh, did pretty well, did decently, and the little guys who may not have started collecting the kind of data that they need to produce a transparency report, who may not have ever thought about fighting back against overbroad process, uh, I think it was a wake-up call for them. So the trends that, that I see are as this industry develops, uh, as um, uh, specifically the sharing economy industry, but as other tech sectors develop, and mature, um, they have to start thinking about policy. Because remember, code is policy. The code that you write in terms of your products, what information you collect, uh, how you store it, that has 
political impacts. That has civil liberties and civil rights impacts, not just tech. Like how long you keep your logs isn't all isn't just a disk space issue. It's not just an analytics issue. It's not just a data mining issue. It's also will the government come knocking and demand all of your logs? And if you have logs going back five years, how many of your users did you just screw? Um, so those are the sorts of things that, that I've identified. The big guys um, started thinking about it and they did pretty well and so we declared victory and moved on. And now it's time for everybody else to start thinking about it too. Michelle, can you give us some background and context into why the Wikimedia Foundation sued NSA? Yes, so the Wikimedia Foundation takes the privacy of its users seriously, partially because of just the concept of privacy is important to us, but partially because it's a part of the very root of our mission to be able to collect and disseminate knowledge globally. When someone, anyone, especially a government, is looking over your shoulder at what you're reading, what you're exploring, and what you're talking about, that changes the very nature of the way you explore and discuss topics. And we want as much unbiased information out there as possible, and we want people to be able to consume that without having to look over your back. Think just in your everyday life, um, who would you want looking at your browser history? Uh, it doesn't matter if it's innocent or not. You, you don't want everyone figuring out what you have ever read on Wikipedia. And we thought that it was time to fight back. The government was and is still doing extreme dragnet surveillance without a warrant or a cause or reasonable suspicion. And that can't stand in a society that has a First and Fourth Amendment that believes in free expression and privacy. And so this is one step that we're taking to be able to better protect our communities. And, and when you're at, uh, at dinner parties or having a drink with people and, and they say, um, you know, nothing to hide, nothing to fear, you know, what's your, your sort of low-level response to those sort of comments? I, I don't think that's true. It's, <laughs> I mean, as I said, if it doesn't matter if you're looking up even the most innocent of things, there's a sense of privacy that each of us feels. If you, someone was walking into your home and just looking around at what you did every single day, it doesn't matter if you are living the most average and innocent life, you're going to feel kind of violated. And this is how discussions become le more subdued when are you going to be able to actually speak out when it matters if you can't feel comfortable doing something that you are comfortable doing every day? And, and, I, and I guess it's, it's, it's not so much a factor of whether someone does feel violated, but there's the potential that someone could feel violated and people should have the right to, to, uh, to, to not be put in that position, I guess. Absolutely. So, so even we've talked in uh, sort of high-level terms about advocacy and about what small companies here um, can do on mass. But you know, if if you had to give some sort of calls to action for the for the startups, for the developers in the room, what concrete stuff can they actually do to start uh, being heard and changing changing the way uh, governments looking at this? So the the, the self-promoting answer would be work with Engine. We want to we want to help you connect. That's why we are here uh, is to connect you with representatives um, and and make sure that they're hearing your voices. I think it's in, incumbent upon you to pay attention to what's happening. Um, you know, read the, the the tech press that's covering these things. I mean, how many people here know what the Burr Feinstein bill is? Okay, it's pretty. It's, it's the Twilio legal team. Which, I mean. Hopefully that's not going anywhere. I don't think it is, uh, but it's terrifyingly bad. And the fact that serious senators can release a bill that would basically mandate that you don't get to use encryption and you have to provide decrypted data to the government if they ask for it, uh, that's bad. Um, so there are a lot th there's a lot you can do beyond just sort of reaching out and talking to me. Like, for example, we're, we're putting out a letter that we're sending to uh, House and Senate leadership uh, explaining why encryption matters to startups and, and why the bills that they are considering might impact the startup community in a different way than it impacts bigger tech companies. So you can't just write something that satisfies the tech world. It, it has to take into account the special needs of uh, a, a smaller developer community, um, which you can find if you go to our Twitter page, engine org. Just look 
it's pinned, find it, sign the petition, talk to us, talk to me afterwards. Um, but you know, it can be as simple as you know, look at look at what the EFF is doing. So sign their petitions, follow their their feed, um, follow what we're doing, follow what these other organizations are doing, because you know we're we're oftentimes the canary in the coal mine here, and we'll be we'll be shouting if you guys listen and try to harness the power that you guys definitely have. I think another thing you can do is just don't make it easy for them. Don't don't collect data that you don't need. Don't keep it in a form that is extremely identifying when you actually, all you need is trends. Um, really ask yourself before you collect data and how long you keep it, like, what's the purpose? What, what are you gonna get out of this? What are your customers gonna get out of it? Is there a way to do this in a way that you don't actually need to know that about the individual so much as what's happening generally so that you can still make your product the best that it can be without compromising the security of your users? Um, just. Do little steps, do what you can. Think about encryption, not just in transit, but in storage. Um, think about what you can do to add transparency. Not um, every transparency report needs to be as shiny as Google's. You, we started really small when we were putting together our initial transparency report. I mean, I kept a spreadsheet. It wasn't really complicated. You just need to start finding ways to get more information out there so that people who are following the bigger trends can start compiling that and bringing it into a bigger conversation. I mean, it's interesting what you say about storing data because you know, any company here that's been through Y Combinator or Techstars or any of the other uh, programs or, or spends time reading TechCrunch will know that the, the, the sort of common thought is track everything, capture everything, don't throw out any data, everything is gold. And so there's, there's a conflict between the norm and what we hear from from the large tech vendors and the advice that you're given. No, I mean, it, it is a conflict, but it's about finding balance. I'm not saying never collect data and never keep it, but do it with some th degree of thoughtfulness. Uh, figure out why you actually need it. Don't just collect it because you feel like collecting it and you have the ability to. And along those same lines, um, you know, remember that it's not just data, it's someone's data. When we're talking about personal data, and that's what privacy is all about, behind those data points are human beings. Um, and you know, if you're Wiki Wikipedia, there's someone who may be looking over that human being's shoulder. Depending on what you are, um, if you're doing healthcare, that's someone's, that's someone's healthcare data. Yes, it's powerful, it's useful, it's interesting, but it's also a person's data. Um, and we kind of get in our little bubble of data is awesome, look what you can do with data, and we forget that is those are human beings behind it. So th things such as de-identifying, pseudonymization, anonymizing, scrubbing it uh, of the PAI can still make it powerful, useful, um, and also protect your users' privacy at the same time. And if you don't have the data, the government can't get it from you. So Sheila, I'm, uh, I'm aware that we are at a, a Twilio event and Jeff would never forgive me if I didn't ask. So can you give us some detail around how, how at Twilio you balance those sort of conflicting drivers? On the one hand, you want to protect your customers. On the other, uh, you need to comply uh, and, you, and you don't want to be a thorn in the side of, of government. So, um, you know, we have to follow the law, but transparency is, a, is an advocacy tool. So we have a transparency report. We try to be as transparent as possible. We support um, other companies who are fighting the government over issues of gag orders. Um, we sign on to that stuff. We make our voice heard on these issues as well. Uh, we are still a business and so we still have to follow the laws of the, comp of the countries where we operate, but it is a democracy still, and we're still allowed to have our voice heard. And so, um, and I'll be honest, law enforcement, including the FBI, is respectful of the fact that we want to have our voice heard. So we make it, we make it heard, and uh, we push back, and we ask things like, do you really need all of that data? And sometimes we get, oh, no, I guess we don't. Um, so don't feel like you can't push back. Don't feel like you can't say something about the issue. And... You can do that in a respectful way. I, I come from a litigation background, so I guess maybe I'm used to sort of fighting it out with somebody and still being respectful at the same time, but that is, it is a possible thing to do. Um, but 
by getting involved in advocacy, um, in uh, talking to c Congress, changing the laws, you can do both what you have to do, because you're legally required, and also um, make your voice heard and try to make it so that that isn't the rule anymore. And so that's how we try to balance those two things. And, and we do our best to try to be as transparent as possible, given the world we live in. Um, if I could jump in on legally required here for a second. Uh, oftentimes, the government will tell you as a small company that you are legally required to do something that you're not legally required to do. That happens all the time. Uh, so the first thing you should do when you get you know, a government agent or a subpoena or a search warrant um, is call your lawyer. And if you don't have a lawyer, email info at EFF.org. Uh, the government will often tell you to do things which you don't have to do. And actually, if you do them, you might expose yourself to liability under something like the Electronic Communications Privacy Act um, by giving data over to the government that you weren't supposed to give with the particular kind of process that you got. So just because you think, or just because the piece of paper says you have to do something doesn't necessarily mean it is. Like government lawyers aren't necessarily the best lawyers in the world and FBI agents usually aren't lawyers at all. Uh, so get some legal advice, and if you don't have a lawyer, email us. So uh, yeah, Apple and FBI has, has kind of jumped the shark. It's uh, even more page views than, than Gawker and Hulk Hogan. Um, where to next? Where do you think, I'll, I'll ask all of you, where do you think um, that's going to go? What's the next six months going to bring in, in, in terms of that action? I'll, I'll put my relatively modestly educated guess out first, I suppose. We don't really know. I mean, frankly, there are, there are a couple of commissions currently outstanding. We're talking strictly about questions related to encryption and security. Um, government is doing kind of what it always does, which is like, let's have some roundtables and let's form a committee and a commission to talk about these things. Uh, that will probably happen. There's not a lot of time left on the legislative calendar this year, but it's an issue that's not going away. I mean, it's an issue that we thought got solved in the 90s and is back now. So uh, the fact that we're still talking about it suggests there's a lot of work, education work left to be done to make sure that they know what's happening. Um, I think some of the worst bills are probably not likely to go anywhere, but that doesn't mean that you know, Congress isn't going to do what it often likes to do, which is try to find a compromise. Unfortunately, you know, math doesn't really compromise and you can't um, break encryption and expect security to be robust. Um, so I think where it goes next is as these committees form, as these commissions really start getting together to talk about what do we do to allow law enforcement to get into your, your servers and access encrypted data, um, it's incumbent upon us to, to join that conversation as loudly and as forcefully as possible. Anyone else want to uh, add to that? Evan's exactly right. <laughs> Plus one. It's the only time I've ever heard lawyers not want to jump in and, <laughs> and say a lot. You, you saw it here first. Um, so we've got a few minutes left. What, what I'm keen to do, you know, we've been talking quite high level, we've talked about some advocacy stuff that, that developers can, uh, can, can do. And we've talked about sort of making developers think about uh, privacy by design. Um, what would be sort of a, a few concrete steps that the developers in the room can take when they go back to work tomorrow and they sit down and they start writing code? What are the things that they should actually actively be thinking about? Whoever wants to take it. <laughs> if you are not already doing this, HTTPS uh, for everything. Um, the Another thing, if you're not starting to track what is happening with um, not just government requests, but also requests for user data from third-party plaintiffs, um, that's also a good thing to start noticing because you'll be able to better figure out what you need to prioritize if you're starting to see an uptick in requests from governments or plaintiffs claiming defamation or privacy violations or anything um, by your users, you're going to want to know that you need to start prioritizing that and budgeting for it and being able to fight back, as Nate said, um, when you can and when you think it's important. Um, I think other than that, just get your voices heard, even if it's something small, 
tweeting about it, following people, staying up to date on the issues, talking to your friends, talking to your legislators. Um, when you see something going in the wrong direction, it's time to speak out now because preventative is always better than trying to fix something, especially legislatively, um, much later. We know that legislation takes forever and you're, you don't want your company to go under because of bad legislation, even if it's only for a few years. A few years is all it takes to ruin many really wonderful ideas. Uh, go read EFF's Who Has Your Back report, not for the, not for the actual chart, but for the, just the categories. Uh, we, we designed the report not just as a rating tool to evaluate the companies that we are rating, but as a roadmap for companies that aren't on the chart, who aren't being evaluated, to say, look, this is what the best practices are. This is what the best, most sophisticated players in the industry are doing. Um, and all of the criteria that we have, all but one maybe, for the sharing economy companies that we rated this year will apply to essentially any consumer-facing uh, company online. So go start thinking about not just best practices in terms of writing clean code in a memory-safe language, please use Rust, um, but, uh, but also in terms of policy, in terms of what, uh, what you can and should be doing and if you aren't doing it, uh, really, are you doing your part as a citizen of, of this global internet? So when Nate comes after you and looks at, uh, evaluates you for that report, it's going to feel really good to get those stars. Um, I think I would say embrace minimalism, data minimalism. Um, let's go, you know, the, the big data is, is all the rage, but let's think about a little bit less personal data. Let's embrace personal data minimalism. And that, that will pay you dividends in many ways. That means that down the road when someone, you, you're wildly successful and, oh my God, we have how much data and it's really expensive and now we never planned how to get rid of it. Um, that will solve you cost down the road. It will solve your security team having to protect that data down the road and will also protect those users whose personal data you're storing because when, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's a breach, whether it's um, hackers, whatever it could be, that um, that data isn't there to, to harm those users. And um, so let's, let's embrace some personal data minimalism. And I think the other thing would be, um, you know, not everybody can afford to have an in-house attorney handling these sorts of issues. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't think about them early on. And maybe finding somebody who is your privacy geek um, at your company who decides to be the one to be the watchdog on these issues and to care about them and to think about, and, and do we really need that data? Um, how, we're gonna, how do we want to what stance we want to take on this particular issue and, and have somebody who's kind of keeping an eye out for the rest of the company um, and have that be kind of one of their, their pet projects uh, can uh, pay off dividends down the road as well when uh, you grow and you become, um, become on, on, uh, on Nate's radar. Um, that's a lot of good advice. I don't know that I have a ton to add other than, yeah, I mean, make sure you know why you're collecting the data you're collecting. I mean, if you can't explain that to a government agency, you um, can't explain it to the EFF, then you're probably in bad shape. Um, and understand, you know, politically that you guys are an incredibly powerful constituency. Um, it just hasn't been harnessed to its full max yet. I mean, I, I always like to say there, there is no party of tech. Uh, it is really neither a Democratic or Republican thing, but they desperately want to be the party of tech. So they will do, they will bend over backwards to listen to you if you give them the opportunity to engage. Um, you know, I, saying that you represent startups is like representing, you know, freedom and ice cream. Everybody loves it. Everybody wants to, to, to be a part of that. So. Um, just, you know, in, in an age when, you know, political uh, power seems pretty thinly dissipated or concentrated in a few, um, you are a part of a really important constituency and I think it's, it's incumbent as to be a good net citizen to um, use that. One more thing. Um, you guys aren't alone. Lean on each other. Uh, use, if you don't have the resources to write law enforcement guidelines, look at a company that has. Ours is licensed CC by SA. You can take it. Um, Go look at and talk to other people and see what you can do. You don't necessarily need a huge team of lawyers to start making little steps. 
And just one final question, I guess, uh, to the non-profits uh, up here, I guess your thoughts around, um, we've, we've talked about uh, educating and advocating upstream, you know, companies educating uh, the legislature around this. Um, what requirement is there on commercial companies to educate their customers around, around best practices? And then uh, you don't get off, Sheila. So what, what, is, what is Twilio doing, apart from putting on this fantastic panel, um, which is great to see so many people think that actually um, the law can be sexy, um, what, is, what is Twilio doing to, to educate its customers on, on what they should be doing and the, the risks and concerns? Am I starting? <laughs> Um, well, we definitely have conversations a lot about these issues with customers as customers are trying to grapple with them and we try to help them. Um, there's only so much we can do. We're not their lawyers, so I, I have to you know, always provide that caveat, but we try to point them in the right direction. There's a lot of resources out there, um, but they're not always in a place that developers are going to know to look. So that's where I try to, try to help steer. Um, you know, we made a point of trying to make our privacy policy itself more readable, accessible, just human readable, um, in addition to our terms of service. But our, our privacy policy also, we're just trying to be right out there and open, and this is what we're doing with your data. Um, and uh, so that, in turn, our, our, we hope that we can lead by example, and our customers will similarly be open and honest about how they're handling their users' data, um, but also so that they can be honest with their customers about how we're using their data um, as that flows downstream. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's panels such as this, reaching out to other small companies and trying to bring them in to, hey, you know, let's, ha let's bring you part of the conversation. We don't want to just be the only small company that's being heard. Um, you know, the great work that Evan's doing with Engine, um, but other small companies should be heard as well, and we want to bring companies along with us. Um, voice of many small startups is way p more powerful than the voice of just us. We don't want to just be the sixth big company, not that we're quite that big yet, but hopefully someday. Um, but you know, we don't want to just be another one of the Apple, the Google, the Facebook, the Amazon. We, we want all the voices heard, and we want to bring uh, our developer community with us. Our developer community does well, we do well. Yeah, I mean, I think. Sorry. Cut it off. Perfect. <laughs> that was short and sweet. Uh, so I want to thank the panelists. Um, we're aware that we're all that stands between you and, and lunch. But if you do want to uh, have any questions for the panelists, feel free to come on up and have a chat. Thanks, everyone.